Welcome to Conquering Your Clownfish, a podcast dedicated to transforming disabilities into special abilities. I'm your host, Brady Murray. Welcome to the Conquering Your Clownfish podcast. It's so exciting to be able to have our special guest today, Misty Coy Snyder. So allow me to share a little bit about her. She is coming to us from New Jersey, where she resides with her husband, Brayden, and their two sons, Clay and Jed. Misty is a published author, performer, and an unstoppable advocate for her son, Jed, who was born with Down syndrome. Shortly after her son, Jed, was born, she created the viral Instagram platform, Happiness is Down Syndrome, to help share stories about lives filled with joy and light. She is also the host of the podcast, Bold Voices, Soft Hearts. Misty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Brady. It's such an honor to be here. Well, we're excited to be able to visit. I um, have to say, I have been such a fan of what you've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. And so Jed is three. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, you had Jed and received a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome right in the middle of COVID. Can you share with us a little bit about that experience? Yes. It's a big part of why happiness is Down syndrome exists. I received the diagnosis on March 6th, 2020, and the world completely shut down two weeks later. My and goodness. So I had one appointment with my husband with the to hear the heartbeat. We got the diagnosis and then we went to see our genetic counselor. And no other appointments were with my husband. They were masks and sanitizer. And if you remember in those early days, we didn't know how it spread. And so you know, it was just this fear of I'm going to run out of sanitizer, you know, that things were missing in the stores. Yep. I had people in my community just bringing me buckets of sanitizer because it was my biggest fear that I was going to go into one of these high risk appointments and not be equipped with what I needed. I didn't know what I was going to get. I didn't know how it was going to impact Jed. And I was grieving what I thought would be the life of this baby. And so it was very, very difficult. So, I mean, I can't even process that because I just think of what Andrea and I went through just in through that grieving, that real grief that is experienced upon receiving a diagnosis that's different than what you expected. But then to add on top of that, the stress that uh, existed within the world at that point in time, that's incredible. I mean, that is incredible. It really was. And I will say it was exceedingly difficult. But now in hindsight, I like to sort of flip the script. And I do think that there were gifts to it. I think that being an extrovert and somebody who very much wears my heart on my sleeve, I think it would have been very difficult for life to continue as normal. I think it would have been difficult to walk into rooms and just break down and not have any control because that's really where I was. And so in some ways, I feel that I was afforded a gift to grieve uh, you know, with my husband, with my older son, and just get some alone time that I desperately needed. Uh, so I'm grateful for that too. Yeah, I bet. And so I am a firm believer that life entrusts us with experiences. Some of those experiences we choose and other choose or other experiences life chooses for us. And this is obviously an experience where life chose this for you. And so if we fast forward again in just a short period of time, I mean, three years is just nothing with where you have gone and what you've been able to do and the movement that you've created to be able to shed the light about what Down syndrome is and the joy that that is. Talk to me about that transformation. And was that something that happened, you know, just maybe talk to me about that transformation because you go from a grieving mother to just an absolute rock star of advocate. <laughs> Thank you. That's very kind. I think there's a few factors here. I think the deep Grief happened in a condensed period of time for me. There was probably three days where I am not going to sugarcoat it. I didn't get out of bed. I thought my life was over. I just could not process. This was, I had not been exposed to disability. I'm a performer. I've traveled. I feel that I am an adventurer, an independent type soul. And while I have a family, I envisioned my sons growing up and moving out. And then, you know, like, so it completely rocked my world and what I thought would future of my family. So I had about three days where I didn't get out of bed and I grieved and I prayed and I cried and I called people that I trusted. But 
after about three days, and especially after that genetic counseling meeting with my husband, where we were blessed with a really wonderful genetic counselor who saw that we were keeping this baby and desperately needed some hope. And she gave it to us. She told me about the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network. She told me about how siblings of children with Down syndrome often grow up to say how rich an experience it was and how much better humans they are. And I was really concerned for my older son. And in that tiny little cubicle of a room before the world shut down, I got my first glimmer of hope with her. And I know that is not many people's stories. And I'm so grateful that that was mine. But I was off to the races. I'm kind of an all or nothing person. And I went to the DSDN and I signed up and I went in a chat room. And for me, the second glimmer of hope was seeing, oh, there's other women going through exactly what I'm going through because it feels so isolating in the beginning. It feels like I'm the only person on the planet who's going through this and nobody can understand. And so being in that chat room and seeing other people say things that I was feeling, it was huge. And I, to this day, sing the praises of the Down Syndrome Diagnosis Network because of that. And so that was it. And I just started, I'm a writer. So I just started writing and processing aloud. I started processing with people. I started praying and, and just praying over my son's body. Like, okay, there's this Down syndrome thing, but please, I just pray health and light and love. And I started singing to him in the womb. And I just, it was for me. It was for him. It was for my family. And the real game changer was when he was born. I just, he rocked my world. And I think any parent knows the joy of seeing your baby for the first time. But I had had six months to process and it was hard and grueling. But when he was there, I was like, you are everything. You are such a joy. And I almost felt this deep grief that I grieved his diagnosis because I loved him so much. And so really three months after he was born, I was like, I want to tell people that his life is so beautiful and he's added so much to us. And I want to share that love and light with other people. Well, you're doing a fantastic job of that. This is a very unique story in what you've shared in regard to really that grieving period was a very short period of time. It was very intense. You experienced what you experienced. I know for a lot of individuals, I know even for myself, that grieving period was months, even years. I would say I still felt a unique emotion when processing the diagnosis of Down syndrome. But hats off to you for being able to recognize that, process that, and then really lean into serving the pain that you know best. And so with your song, I Found My Way, this is a music video. We'll put it in the show notes. It's a beautiful, beautiful song and something that I personally have just fallen in love with. And so can you share with us about the creation and the inspiration behind that? I'm not a songwriter. I've been a singer my whole life, but my dad is a ridiculously amazing musician who's worked in Hollywood for years and years. And and he he said, you know, Misty, you have so many ideas and you have so many thoughts that you write and you're a singer. Like, I think you should write a song. You know, I'm a musical theater actor. And so there's so many songs that make me think of Jed. And that's why it's Happiness is Down Syndrome because I thought of the song Happiness from your good man, Charlie Brown, which is all about Pull joys, finding a pencil, having an ice cream. That's what our kids are about, right? It's the simple joys that make you slow down and make all the other things sort of fade into oblivion. So that's really the basis of Happiness is Down Syndrome, that song that represents our kids so well. But there's copyright issues. There's things you have to deal with when you're dealing with songs that were written by other people. So my dad just empowered me, write a song. And when you get inspired, like make it a song. You'll, you'll hear a melody. And sure enough, you know, three copies of the 21st chromosome, three, two, one, with that we all reference often, but in the music world and in the dance world, you say three, two, one as you're counting off, right? That's right. I just had this melody in my head, three, two, one, and how I feel about him now, but going back to how it was then and reconciling the two, they're allowed to coexist. I don't need to feel shame nor do you or any parent over the grief that we had. That's a, we're humans. That's our process. And it doesn't make us love our children any less, but that juxtaposition of how it was right now, it sounds so fun because I look in your eyes and I see the joy, but back then it didn't feel that way. And that's okay. And if you're there, 
we're here for you. That, that's very timely advice, Misty, and actually very applicable. Um, I'm in the process right now of, of writing a book about this adventure, about this experience. And actually just this week, as I was writing and sharing some of those emotions and feelings that I felt in those early stages, that shame actually came back and that guilt came back. And like, it was there. I mean, Nash is 16 years old now and, and I felt that again. And so just to hear you say that is actually very liberating and very impactful. So thank you for sharing that. Oh, absolutely. And I feel like we're a team, like we have to remind each other of that as in this community, like it's okay. It's a fluid process. There's going to be times where we're just like, this is the best life. And there's going to be times where we're like, this is really hard and that's okay. And I have had those experiences where I'm like, geez, I'm an advocate and I feel really <laughs> Right? Yep. That is so true. I'd like to switch gears. You did a post just a few days ago, actually, four days ago to be exact. Happy belated birthday. Misty has a birthday on Valentine's Day, which is so cool. <laughs> And so you did a post that just resonated very well with me, and I'm actually going to read it for our listeners, and I'd love to discuss it with you. And so it reads this way. The hardest part about having a child with a disability is not my child's disability. It's about the ancient and archaic constructs and borders and grandiose ideas built around him. It's about the extremes in either direction, one being Quote, he's an angel sent for a holy purpose, and you are the saint entrusted with him. While this sounds lovely and is usually very well intended, it actually takes away from the very humanity of the child and parent. By making my son an angel and me a saint, we are isolated on an island without the services, community, and aid we often need. It puts us on a pedestal out of reach. The other extreme is pity and ableism. The lack of ability to see the inherent beauty in the life of one who is disabled, the assumption that any life that doesn't conform to societal norm must be pitied at least or obliterated at the worst. This is beautiful, and this is very impactful. In fact, I've had many instances, especially when Nash was first born. I mean, this is still to this day. Individuals will come and very well-intentioned, very well-meaning say, he is such a saint, like he's a very special, special boy and special boys only come to very special people. You and Andrea must be saints. And I just smile and I thank them. But inside, like, I agree with what you're saying. And, and maybe you can share a little about what stemmed this post. Yes, I think that having the two platforms that I do, I I have a lot of these conversations with people and the, at the back door of the DMs, you know what I mean? Where people just say, oh, and Again, I think that 99.5% of people have the best intentions and want oh. to learn more and want to just say, good job. And I appreciate that. I really do. I appreciate it because it can be a weary journey and we can become tired. And so when somebody comes in and just goes, you're doing an amazing job, it's I appreciate it so much. And I'm sure you do too. But at the same time, there is a, and I'm speaking from personal experience, so I don't want to put any words in anybody's mouth, but I do think that when I felt sorry for someone or when I didn't know what to say, I would say things and I still say things like when somebody is suffering with, with cancer or something along the lines that I have not experienced, I feel inadequate. And so I want to say, you are so strong. You're the strongest person I've ever met. You are a rock star, which again, like we refer to each other that way, because in I, many ways you are to in it to battle and struggle and conquer the things that you have. However, we did not ask for this holy purpose. We we yeah. are living our lives the best that we can, and we are doing the best we can with what we've been given. And so by saying, oh, you are a saint and your child is an angel, it separates us. It doesn't make us come together. It separates us and says, oh, well, that's a calling for you and good job. And I'm going to stay <laughs> because I don't want to life. And I see now in my early 40s, I see friends who've had babies in their late 30s, early 40s go, oh, um, like, 
I can see the fear. Like that's oh, right. It might happen to me. I mean, I was only 38. There's people who have babies way into their 40s and 50s, even <laughs> Janet Jackson. But like, there's a fear of that's so great for you. You're holy and wonderful, but I could never, I could never. And and how does that make me feel? That makes me feel like people would rather not exist than have my journey. Like, totally. Ouch. Totally. You know? 100% I, agree. I speak to that. Yep. That has absolutely been an experience that I've had. And then on the flip side of that, the other side of this is really a, a message I would say that internally I have felt is individuals will, and again, well-intentioned, but they'll say, you know, all in essence, their message is all Nash needed to do. Like he's here more for us than we are for him. And, and in essence, he doesn't really have to do anything. Like he's born just by him being born because he has Down syndrome. There's zero expectation on what he needs to do. Like he gets a free pass. He's already just the most kind, loving little baby anyways. Like there's nothing that Nash has to do. And initially, you know, when individuals would say that, it took me a number of years just to process that and think through, like, I actually inherently in my heart don't believe that. And I believe that every one of us is here on this earth for a reason and for a purpose and that we have divine potential and that we have the ability to be able to impact and do special things to help others to be in the service of others. And what I have found as well, that those entrusted with a disability, especially have a divine purpose, especially have a work to be able to do, and that they have responsibilities and they got to get to work just as much as we have to get to work. And so I'd love to hear just your thoughts on that other side of the coin. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think unknowingly it's dehumanizing because it's almost like saying like if you have a, a pet who comes and lays on your lap and you say, well, that dog is just for you to comfort you and whatever they're, what do you call it? A support yeah. animal, something. It kind of puts our kids in that light to say That's that. Right. That is not the case. The inherent worth of our children that, that like you said, we all have a purpose. We all have something to give and not just receive. And I've already seen it. Jed is three and a half years old and he's given and spread more joy I mean, I think that's what keeps me going on social media is that I hear people say, what joy she brings me through the screen. And then when people meet them, what well, I can't explain it. It's almost divine. He brings me so much joy. He's a wonderful person. That is his humanity. That is who he is. And each of our children, though they may all have Down syndrome, your Nash and my Jed have a unique purpose. That's in right. the way that they bring light to this world. And that is fully human. That yep. is not a, a support child. That's you know? Right. That is a beautiful way to explain that. And I've actually never considered that or thought of that as individuals with, say, Down syndrome being labeled inadvertently, but as a support child, if you may. And the reality is you couldn't be more correct in the sense that, like, Jed and Nash and each of these individuals have a divine worth, a divine soul, and a divine mission, a work that they need to do. And for those that have spent time around individuals with a disability, oftentimes what I feel is, and what individuals feel, is that they are fully accepted, that they are seen for who they are, that they don't have to be somebody who they're not. And that is the beautiful thing that I think especially those individuals with Down syndrome are able to bring out in that light and that joy, in a sense, in essence, allow us to be our best selves. Yes, absolutely. And I feel as though the extra chromosome, I've said this, and I'm still sort of working through this in my head, but the extra chromosome, I think, brings something with it that we lack. Like we always look, I feel like society in general looks at disability as something lacking, something that they don't have what we have, which is the penultimate, right? Right. But there yeah. is something that individuals with disabilities have that we do not have, whether it's right. someone who has a, a, a musical gift or an artistic gift, uh, a way of expressing things that we would never think of. There is a something that they have that we need our eyes open to. And so 
flipping that script and saying, no, 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 I really lack the ability to look at the birds the way my son does. And I'm learning from him, you know? And I think that people who are resistant to that are uncomfortable with the idea of any disability being something to learn from. God forbid. I mean, no, I, most people wouldn't say that. There are the trolls who would say terrible, horrific things, but most yeah. of us have a lot of junk to deal with in our heads, myself included. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that I think is a great introduction or even segue into going into the whole purpose and idea behind this podcast. And so the name of this podcast being Conquering Your Clownfish, and it comes from the inspiration given from our favorite clownfish, Marlin, who was an overprotective and often anxious father of his son, Nemo, who had a disability, right? He had a gimpy fin in essence. And so Marlin took it upon himself to make sure that nothing ever bad happened to Nemo and that he really was safe and that nobody ever made fun of him or he never was endangered and never really given the opportunity to sing that song that he's meant to sing. And through that amazing movie, we see that Nemo truly did have a gift and a song that was meant to sing. And I look at what you are doing with Jed and you are allowing him, you are empowering him to sing the song that he's meant to sing and to share his story. And I just am extremely thankful for that and what you're doing to to allow him to uh, do what he is divinely meant to do. Isn't it funny how when you talk to people, you everyone makes a different connection with a song or a movie or a show or a character or a book. That is so beautiful. And it's such an honor to walk beside him, right? And to try my best as a mom to lay that groundwork in you as a dad. Like we're just doing our piece and it doesn't make us saints. It makes us loving parents. Lifting where we stand, trying to, to carry the, the responsibility that we have and accomplish the role that we have as parents, because these children were entrusted to us. And I feel a large part of my responsibility with my boys is to just simply give them the opportunity to let their light shine and get them into the world, into the opportunity to be able to influence others. And sometimes it's uncomfortable and sometimes it takes a little bit extra effort to get them out there and all of the things that come with that, but by and large, it is definitely worth it. And so in closing, I'd love to ask, you are still relatively new to the disability community, but it's that freshness and that new vision that I think is the movement that really we are seeking in our community. So if you could wave your magic wand and look forward into the future and say, here are some wish list items that I would love to be able to evolve and, and change, and maybe not even change, but just transform in relation to how individuals with a disability are seen and treated, what would that be? I think the post that you read earlier really touches on where my heart beats, that those outside of the disability community, which used to be me, and I can still feel her inside of me, like when, like you said, an uncomfortable moment comes and I'm apologizing that my son is just inhabiting space. That's the old me, right? The fear and the discomfort. And so I suppose I hope that the world outside of ours can learn to see our kids in the light of who they are and not put them in a box. We don't want to put anyone in a box, right? We're all unique individuals. And so having that openness to learn, having that openness to open our ears and hear an experience that's different than ours and not feel the need to paint a pretty picture or toss us out, but just an openness. And I do see progress in that area. I do see, I see way more exposure to disability than I had growing up. I really didn't know. The only point of reference I had was that show Life Goes On with Quirky. And I think about that show all the time. And how that was such grace that I watched it religiously because I saw the beauty and the heart together in harmony in that show. I did. And so I hope that we can somehow come together and see, yes, the similarities. This all sounds very kumbaya, but it, it is my hope that we can see the similarities, that we cannot isolate. That's my biggest thing. Let's not isolate you may not have a child with Down syndrome, but I 
guarantee there are things in your life that make you feel like you're on an island. So let's come together and let's talk about those things. Let's have an open dialogue. Let's learn from one another. Let's be quick to listen and let's not try to put a Band-Aid on things or make it more comfortable for us. Let's sit in the discomfort and let's talk about it, you know? And again, I'm speaking this to myself as well because I naturally want to make everybody feel comfortable and everybody around me. But you know what? It's not life. We have to sit in the hard and we have to encourage one another to just be like, you know what? Yeah, my son is screaming in this restaurant. It's okay. Uh, you know, I don't know what to say. It's, it, he, he's uncomfortable. He's overwhelmed. We're going to do the best we can. My sweet older son, we were in a pet shop the other day and out of nowhere, Jed just started screaming. He was frustrated about something and doesn't have the words to speak it or the signs yet. He does, but it's limited. And this came up to my older son. Why is your brother screaming? And I was like sweating bullets and like trying to find the exit and whatever. And Clay just said, you know, something upset him. He'll be okay. Wow. And it was so beautiful. I was like, yeah, he's a little of a moment. It was like two seconds long. And sure enough, he got over it and we just kept looking at the pets. We don't all have to be perfect. We're not perfect. So we do our best. It's beautifully said, Misty. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you for being a guest on our show today. As promised, we'll include all the links to the items that we have referenced in relation to the beautiful song, the amazing work that you're doing on your social media channels, and uh, obviously your podcast as well. And so, Misty, thank you for being a guest today, and we wish you the very best. I am so thankful to be your teammate in this disability journey. I feel the same way, Brady, and I just have to say how much I admire and I'm so appreciative of the work that you and your whole organization, your family, you inspire me daily. So thank you so much for sharing this time with me. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conquering Your Clownfish. If you liked what we discussed on the podcast today and want to continue the conversation, please visit us at conqueringyourclownfish.com. And please don't forget to subscribe.